Well, good morning. Good morning again. Uh, I am so glad to be here and, to, uh, and starting really into part three of Christmas Uncensored. Now, if this is your first time here, you don't know what we're talking about the last few weeks, stay tuned. We've been talking specifically about Christmas a little bit more in detail than maybe what you're used to or maybe you even knew. And the reason for that is when we take what sometimes becomes a two-dimensional story, it's a nice thing, you know, you see beautiful pictures of it, you maybe even see the movie of it, there tends to be a lifelessness that develops, that we, we have a hard time connecting with the realities of the story, with, with the people in it. Two weeks ago, we talked about Mary, and we talked about this amazing teenage girl who was walking into a lifetime of ridicule and suspicion and all this simply by saying yes to God, to do what he asked. Last week, we talked about Joseph, who she was betrothed to. And Joseph, we talked about, was a man who has no recorded words in the entire Bible, but his actions spoke much louder than any words he ever could have spoken. And we see that he was a man of mercy and a man of compassion and humility. And, and what an awesome, awesome, awesome thing to see. And, and again, the reason that we want to go and, and look at these is so we can relate to this story. For those of us that have been uh, maybe in church a lot of our life and we've heard the story a thousand times, it just can easily become lifeless. And I don't want us to miss it. I don't want us to miss, miss the depth of this story. Uh, I don't want us to be, uh, uh, just get to this time of year and just go through the motions or maybe be distracted by other things. So today we're going to start in to our third part, and we're going to talk about the visitors, the visitors. Uh, we'll get to who they are in a second. We're going to break it down as to who they are, and when I say break it down, that sounds like I'm a rapper. Break it down, and I'm not a rapper, so I'm just putting that out there. Anyway, uh, with that... Um, <laughs> So with that, uh, as I was thinking about this this week, I thought about it. You know, for some people, there's one song at Christmas time that may strike fear into their heart. It's not Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. It's I'll Be Home for Christmas. And here's why. Because there may be those family members that are about to show up at your house that you're thinking, oh, no, please don't come home for Christmas. Please, I'm asking you not to stop by. This can easily be a song that terrifies people because some of us have guests at Christmas time that, well, let's, let's just put it mildly. The movie National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation resonated with a lot of people because it's set up about every nightmare we have. When we have people in for the holidays, some people have them in just for Christmas Day. Some people will have them in for a week or two. I mean, it is a long stretch. And all of the awkwardness, all of the uncomfortable situation, you're sleeping in a bed that isn't necessarily yours. Uh, you know, you're getting locked in the attic. You, you, there's the last minute Christmas shopping. You have a family member who all of a sudden shows up that you didn't even invite. And you've got to be cordial and all of that. And, and visitors sometimes cause us nightmares and stress and loss of sleep. However, we've also been visitors. Many of us have been visitors at Christmas time. We've been at somebody's house. Sometimes there's very sweet memories tied to those. One Christmas that always sticks out to me with, with my upbringing was when uh, my family, we were living in St. Louis, Missouri at the time, and we went to go visit my grandmother in Philadelphia. Now, we didn't have a lot of money, so you drive. You don't fly, you drive. And this is back in the days when you could have kids sit in the front seat with no child seat, in the middle, nonetheless. That was me, number four child. I was up front between my parents. We drove from 8 a.m., till 2 a.m. the next morning to get from St. Louis to Philadelphia to my grandmother's house. And it was a great time. You know, I, the only thing that was weird about it, you know, it was a long drive. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think we took our cat back then. We had to, like, get little pet tranquilizers so it would sleep the whole time. So you got six people, four kids and a cat in a litter box in a car. Yes, a litter box in the car. Now, it wasn't for us. It was for the cat. Um, so we drive, you know, across the country, and, you know, back then we don't have nice DVD players or iPads or iPhones and a car to entertain. No, no, we didn't even have a cassette player. We had an AM radio. So how do you entertain your time? Mom and Dad made us sing. You know how weird it would be for people today 
If you're driving down, you know, uh, the interstate, and you drive by a car that's completely filled with people, and you see all of their mouths moving in unison, uh, that's just weird. You know, that's scary. But back then, it was normal. That's what we did. That's how we had to entertain ourselves. So we got to my, my grandmother's, and, and that's a Christmas we'll always remember. I mean, the journey there, uh, all of that, and that's just the memories there. And it was one of the last Christmases we had with my grandmother uh, that we got to spend with her. And what an awesome, awesome, awesome time. But we were the visitors then, and we hoped that we brought joy to them. We hoped that we had a great time and we didn't cause any misery for them. Christmas visitors can bring great memories, and they can bring some not-so-great memories for all of us. Today, we're going to talk about two sets, and really, of the first Christmas visitors ever on record. Uh, now, granted, you know, uh, Jesus, uh, this is a little factoid, we recognize Christmas as the birth of Christ, but that is not necessarily when he was born was December 25th. It's a tradition that's been handed. This is the time, though, I say that we recognize it. Uh, we don't know the exact date, but this is when we choose to recognize it. It's an awesome time. So as we get talking about these first Christmas visitors that stopped by, I want us to take, once again, an uncensored look at them, a realistic look at them, because when you drive by and you see a nativity set, maybe you have a nativity set in your house, it doesn't really give us the depth of who these people were and things that they had to deal with in their life. Now, some of us, I know, have found uh, that this is a miserable time of year. And, and frankly, when we hear the story, there's lots of things that distract us from really putting our mind into the realities of it. We are distracted by commercialism oftentimes. The hype of the season. You get distracted by all the gift giving you still have yet to do. By the way, we blocked Amazon in here, so if you're doing any of your shopping while you're in here, uh, I'm kidding, we didn't do that, but maybe we should next time. Um, uh, anyway, uh, you get blocked up by the co commercialism, and you don't have time to really reflect on the truth of this. Sometimes, as I said, it's the hardships that come with the season that doesn't give us the opportunity to think deeper about these Christmas visitors. Sometimes it's just we're addicted to busyness. You've been to 15 different concerts and dances and all of that this season. And that was just in the first week of Christmas. Uh, it, it, it's crazy. We can, some of us are addicted to that. We love that. And, and we don't take the time to just ponder, reflect, pause. And so today I want to. Today I want to specifically with these Christmas visitors. My big idea today is this, that Jesus' birth should cause us all to wonder and worship. It should cause us to wonder and worship. If you've heard this story a lot, since you were a little kid, that first one may be the hardest one, to wonder again. To wonder again. But I want us to wonder again today. I want to talk about some reasons to wonder. And why that wonder oftentimes leads to worship Unfortunately, Jesus' birth oftentimes causes us to be callous and distracted rather than to wonder and worship. So today we're going to look at two groups of visitors, the shepherds and the magi. And we want to take a little bit of a deeper look at who they were, what we know of them just from cultural historical account. So it gives us a little bit more of an idea of some of the scandal, if you will, of who the first Christmas visitors were. You may complain about Uncle So-and-so who's going to show up uh, because they're, you know, crass or rude or anything like that. But when you look at these visitors, I want you to understand just how scandalous it was that they were there. Let's start with the shepherds. The shepherds are our first group of visitors. And uh, at this point, uh, setting up the story, Jesus has been born. He's born uh, in Bethlehem, which is a small city about six miles south of Jerusalem, down in Judea, the southern part of Israel. He's been born there. Bethlehem is the city of David. It's where King David was born. It's about at this time, they estimate about 600 people living there. But due to the census, which is why Jesus was even born there, Joseph and Mary had to go to his family line, where it came from, which was Bethlehem, there was going to be a lot more people there. That's why there was no room in the inn. It was a small town, and all of these people went back to where their ancestors were from, and so everything was overcrowded. There were people galore there, and Jesus is born in the midst of this. And that same 
day, that same night that Jesus was born, in Luke chapter 2, we're going to start at verses 8 and 9. You can follow along on Hope Church app or you can follow along up front. It starts this way. It says this, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. I'm going to break this part a, a, a little bit at a time. Shepherds. Shepherds. In this day and age are a common labor position. Not a job that most people were like, you know what, when I grow up, I want to be a shepherd. This was the job that pretty much nobody else wanted, but many people had. It wasn't glamorous. They weren't rolling in dough. They, they, they were not, at many times, they were considered outcasts in the community because it was such a low-level position. Uh, you wouldn't want to associate with them. They're just common people, okay? They're, they, st- they work with sheep all day. They got sheep feces all over them. I mean, they smell of sheep. They don't shower, all of this. And, and actually, that's another reason they were an outcast. They were a religious outcast. In order for you to go worship at the temple, you had to go through a ceremonial cleaning. You had to be clean to go in so that you could present yourself before a god these are shepherds they didn't have necessarily access to showers or baths all the time they would have to leave their flock to go do worship and they couldn't do that frequently because they were unclean and dirty and they'd been around animal you know dirt and all of that they couldn't just roam on into church you know come as you are at the temple the sunday and and so on and just walk in and everyone's like hey welcome and all that no they would be cast out because they were unclean they had to cleanse and as a result of that because they didn't have that opportunity to constantly get themselves clean to go be a part of the temple they couldn't go so now there's this person this you know view that well they must be irreligious they don't come to temple all the time they must not really believe in god you know uh, how 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 bad are they? So they were not just social outcasts because they were low-level common people. They were also religious outcasts. These were tough, tough men. They had to defend their flocks from wild animals. And they didn't have a 12-gauge. They had a staff. Maybe they had a slingshot. These were tough people. They weren't impressed by much. They were salt of the earth. You know that type. You know that type. One thing that was interesting I I stumbled across about the shepherds was to give you an idea of how uh, less they were viewed in society. There were two groups of people at this time who were not allowed to testify in court for anything. Because of the culture, women were one. The other were the shepherds. Were not allowed to testify in court because they were viewed so low of a position. It says that they were out in the fields uh, watching their flocks at nighttime. An angel of the Lord appears to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. The glory of the Lord. Okay, we sometimes read that, and okay, that's great. Let me explain the glory of the Lord. You see the glory of the Lord several times throughout Scripture. And the glory of the Lord, whenever it shows up, it is intense light. Intense light. In fact, Moses, back in the Old Testament, said, God, I want to see your glory. And God said, uh, you can't handle it. You would incinerate, burn up, and die. So let me tell you what I'll do. I'll let my glory pass. You're going to hide around this, this cave. And when it's starting to fade, then you can take a look. And even when the afterglow of God's glory had passed, Moses was overwhelmed at the, the glory and the, the grandeur and the brightness of God. So here we are in the dead of night, These salt-of-the-earth men are watching their flocks. It's just another night. They're protecting them from wild animals. And all of a sudden, an an angel appears. And the glory of the Lord, this brightness, this grandeur, appears before them. These were not people exposed to special effects movies. These weren't people who went to go watch theater with great effects and pyrotechnics. No, these were common people. And now the glory of the Lord is before them. And they were terrified. Boy, there's a surprise. I'd be terrified. You better believe they were terrified. The angel goes on in the next few verses and says, tonight, the Messiah, the promised one, you know who he is. You're Jewish. You know who he is. You've been waiting for him for thousands of years. Guess what? He's been born in Bethlehem, just over there, 
He's been born there. You can find him wrapped in, in uh, strips of cloth and laying in a feeding trough. Now, what's interesting about that is they, were, they didn't do a what? Uh, the king, the Messiah we've been waiting for a thousand years is wearing what? And he's laying in what? No, no. Their reaction was different. After the angels had declared the glory of God, peace on earth, and goodwill towards uh, unto whom God's favor rests, in verse 15 it says this, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. It says the angels leave and the shepherds who had not been told to go find Jesus say, I want to go see this for myself. I'm gonna, God just told us this. I'm going to take him to his word. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Don't you feel bad for the shepherd who probably had to be left behind to take care of the sheep? Yeah, hey, that was awesome. You stay back here and watch them. It had to be like the new guy. Uh, and all the rest went down. Uh, <clears throat> we don't know how many shepherds went down. It could have been a lot of shepherds. There is no number given to us. But they don't just say, wow, that was awesome. These angels appeared and declared the Messiah has been born. No, they wanted to see it for themselves. And so they rally up, they get their stuff, and they go several miles down uh, and into Bethlehem. And it says that they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby. They hurried off and found Mary, Joseph, and the baby. Now, I would read this line multiple times and skip over it. But you can see their excitement. And there's another part of that. They went to Bethlehem to find him. Most likely, there was not one stable in Bethlehem. This means that they were driven to find this Messiah. They go down into Bethlehem, and they went to every stable they needed to until they found the right one. They were persistent in it. They continued to seek him out. That means that they probably got a lot of stares when they went up to another stable and were like, hey, was a baby born here? What? <laughs> this is a stable. Uh, wrong place. What's wrong with you? Shepherds, get out of here. Uh, uh, they had to be scorned and looked at strangely, but they didn't give up. And then they find Joseph and Mary, and then, then they talk to Joseph and Mary and say, boy, if you even know what just happened to us. And Mary and Joseph could go there and say, boy, if you even know what we've just been through the last few months. Let's tell our stories here. And there's this amazing moment where they come and they see the baby, the Messiah, lying in the manger. In verse 17, it says this, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Not only did they go to see him, they did something else. They didn't shut up about it. They told everyone they could about it. They went around town. They're like, the Messiah's been born. The Messiah's been born. The woman's been promised. He's over there in the stable. And once again, people had to be like, what are you talking about the stable? The Messiah is not going to be born in a stable. There's no way. And yet, they spread the word. And all the people who heard it were amazed. You know what's interesting? It says that they were amazed. You know what it doesn't say that they did? They were amazed and they went to see for themselves. It just says they were amazed. The shepherds had to do something. And then they couldn't be quiet about it. I'm sure this is something they told their grandkids about, their children, their wives, everyone they ever met. Oh my goodness, we were on this hill and the angel of the Lord appeared and, and so on. And, and they were enthusiastic that they had found the Messiah. You know, one thing I love being in all these years of ministry is people who decide to become followers of Jesus is the enthusiasm that they have. The first few months, even a few years after they have just chosen to follow Jesus and all the stuff that God starts doing in their life, you can't keep them quiet. In fact, sometimes you wish you could keep them quiet because they will walk right up to the most hardened atheist and say, let me tell you about Jesus. You need him. And you're like, no, let's have a conversation with them. You know, they have enthusiasm. They love what they found. It has changed their life. It's changed their perspective on everything. I guess for those of us that have followed Christ for a long time, so what happens? Why don't we still have that? Why does the fire die too often in all of us? And things such as, you know, even the Christmas story and Christ coming to earth, it just loses its weight. It just becomes a historical account. No different than a history book lifeless as anything. 
It seems that, you know, even in our walks with Christ, sometimes there's a honeymoon period. You know, that first, you know, year or two of marriage is fantastic and awesome and everything's great. And, and, and then, you know, just it changes. It evolves over time. It's why children as well. Children, you know, my kids the other day decided they were going to jump up and down, and that was fun for them. And I'm sitting there going, you're weird. <laughs> Jumping up and down is not fun. I'm 43 years old. My knees are starting to hurt me, okay? It's not fun. But they find fun, and, and then something happens when we get older. That the fire dies, and the enthusiasm fades, and everything just becomes facts. Because we can explain it all. This didn't happen with the shepherds at this moment. They were excited. They had the enthusiasm. And I hope we get that enthusiasm back in our own lives it continues and says, the shepherds returned to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. These common men, these tough as nails, salt of the earth, nothing impresses me. I fight wild animals and defend my flock. We're having a praise service when they went back to their flocks. They had seen the Messiah. These outcasts of society the ones nobody wanted to associate with, the ones who couldn't even testify in court, they were the first visitors of Christmas. The angels invited them. God made sure they were the ones who came. Not the high and the mighty or the religious leaders so they could be proven, oh, Jesus is born, the Messiah is here, and then all them be well. No, Jesus went to the common people first. Jesus was the first one to be visited by common people. But there was a second group, the Magi. The Magi. Now, they've been called kings, they've been called wise men. I'm going with Magi because that's uh, the original word there. Uh, it, 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 the Magi are often the ones who get the most uh, of a butcher job done on who they were, when they came, where they were, all of this. But I want to give us a more realistic perspective with it. And the Magi, let's uh, pick it up. It's in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, and we're going to also look at verses 9 to 11. It says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where's the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So, it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Now, many people immediately assume this means immediately after Jesus was born, even the same night the shepherds were there. The reality is, and I could get into all the details, but I can point you to some great articles that spell it out. This could have been anywhere from 40 days after Jesus was born all the way up to literally two years. Mary just had a baby. She was not going to be moving anywhere soon to go back to Bethlehem where they, or Nazareth where they were from up north. They stayed in Bethlehem for a while. Maybe part of this was, and this is speculative, I'm not saying this is fact, maybe part of it was because of the whole, you know, everyone having suspicions about them having a child and who was the father and all that. We don't know. But the reality is, is they stayed for a time in Bethlehem. Part of that was Jesus, after eight days, had to be circumcised. After that, Mary, uh, we know, did a cleansing ceremony which uh, women went through after giving birth, which would take place about 30 days after, uh, 33 days afterwards, so at least a month, and now these magi come rolling into the scene. Now, who were the magi? Magi were astrologers. Didn't see that coming, did you? They were astrologers. They studied the star stars. They were all about dreams and, and, you know, sort of like casting lots and all this mysterious sort of new agey type stuff. You know, this is who they were. They were astrologers, but they were also political advisors. They were very powerful people. You see Magi all throughout scripture, not just here. Magi were at the time of Daniel. When a king would call all of his uh, his advisors who, you know, uh, like would try to interpret a dream for them or whatever. They were magi. Magi were all throughout Scripture. These were no exception. They were political advisors. They were astrologers. They were dream interpreters. It says they came from the east, which would have been probably the Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran area, even Pakistan. 
They traveled for a while. They would not have gotten there immediately. We don't know if the star rose before Jesus was born and they were already on their way when Jesus was born or if it was the night Jesus was born, the day Jesus was born, that they began their journey. Whatever the case, it took them a while to get there. It wasn't overnight. They didn't have cars. They didn't get a flight. Uh, They had to traverse all the way, traverse so far, as the song says. Um, So, it goes on. Um, They would have been familiar, and this is one thing. It says, uh, they went and said, we want to see the one who's been born, the king of the Jews. This is a significant statement here. They were saying this to King Herod, who was the ruling governor over Judea. Herod is a scoundrel. Can't get into details of it right now, but he was a scoundrel. He had been dubbed the king of the Jews by the Romans who put him in his position. So all of a sudden he hears, a new king of the Jews has been born. I'm the king of the Jews. Who is this person? And that leads him to come up with a horrible atrocity he does later on. But they go to him and they say, they're from the east. They don't even worship Yahweh God that the Jews worship. And they're saying, the king of the Jews, we want to meet him. How did they know about that? See, the Magi, I mentioned a second ago, were very powerful political advisors for hundreds of years. 500 years before this, somebody was appointed to be the head Magi over all of them, if you will, the head dream interpreter. And this head dream interpreter had given some prophecies regarding the king of the Jews. It was a man named Daniel. If you remember the story When Daniel and the lions did and all that, he had been put over and given a point of authority over some of these dream interpreters and such. And now, this prophecy that he gave back then, they would have been familiar with about a coming Messiah. And they remembered it, and they travel because of seeing this star based on prophecy, and they come all the way over to find this king of the Jews that they don't even necessarily believe in at this point. Many believe that they may have actually been Zoroastrian, which is a a small religion that still exists over in Iran. And they were the second Christmas visitors. They weren't even faithful Jewish people. And they came. And it carries on in the story. It says this. um, After they uh, had heard the king, the king says, hey, go find this king of the Jews. I want to worship him. He has other plans. After that, they went on their way And the star they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This star... There's a lot of confusion over what it was. Was it an angel? Was it a comet? What was it? How did it sort of settle over a house? Don't know. Don't know. But Scripture tells me that it must have been something that was unusual and something that they could identify and understand that it was settling over this house. And these astrologers go into this house, not stable, house. They go into it, and it says they saw the child. And what was their first reaction? They bowed down. The word used here for bowed down is they literally threw themselves down on the ground. These powerful political advisors from another country, ones that had power and authority over many people and many rulers, are now throwing themselves on the ground in front of a child. And it says that they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures. They didn't just worship, they gave him something valuable. Gold, frankincense of our two aromatic gifts. Gold, something of great worth. These Gentile astrologers and political advisors who easily could have had people fall before them are now falling in front of a small Jewish baby. A poor one, by the way. With poor parents. These men who had more money than they could even think of are bowing before this poor child. They met something that was bigger than they had ever imagined, and they were blown away with wonder by it. The shepherds and the magi were were different. The shepherds were powerless. They were outcasts. They were Jewish. The magi, they were powerful. They were upper-class citizens, wealthy, and they were Gentiles. Didn't even believe in God, or at least Yahweh in this point. But they had a similarity, both of them. See, both 
the shepherds and the magi were seeking the Messiah. And nothing was going to stop them. They traveled miles, and they, they, when they came upon him, they were changed and they were moved to worship of this child that most of us might have looked at if we didn't know the prophecies and said it's just a baby. But they knew there was something different. They knew there was something different about this child, different than any other baby they would ever see in their entire life or that they had seen before. I have some challenges out of this for us. If this is the first time you've really engaged with this story, I want to encourage you this holiday season to continue seeking after this baby and who he was. This is the season to ask questions and to investigate And don't just ask questions, find answers. It's easy for us to ask a lot of questions. Well, I don't know if I believe about this because blah, 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 blah. Investigate it and find real answers. Real answers. Seek God's word because I have full confidence that if you ask God hard questions and you seek answers to hard questions, he will be faithful in answering them or bringing the people into your life to help those be answered. I have no, no hesitation in telling you ask hard questions and seek those answers answers. You may say, think that uh, God wouldn't accept me. God wouldn't take me. May I remind you that today we talked about the fact that the two Christmas visitors, the groups of them, you had one set that were poor outcasts, common people, and the other were powerful religious, or excuse me, powerful political leaders. I'm pretty sure if you take those two polar opposites, you're more than welcome to come worship him and be before him. No question of that. If you've been in the faith a long time and the story has become lifeless, I first have to challenge you to guard your heart. Guard your heart from just taking this as a mere historical story. Void of feeling and emotion and truth and depth and impact in your life because this has significant impact in your life. I want to encourage you that you commit time in this holiday season alone alone to reponder this account on your own and talk to God through it, to spend time marinating in it and let God seep back into you and breathe life back into your spiritual life and your walk with him so that when you come upon this story again, you are refilled with the wonder that you once had when you were a child or the first time you heard it. Because wonder I know leads to worship. It's hard for me to worship something I can't have wonder about. Embrace wonder again. Embrace mystery of the nativity and spend time sitting in it. If powerful people who didn't even fully believe in this God can find a motivation to fall before and worship this child, why can't we? Why can't we? The season I want to remind everybody here, there's always room with Jesus for you. And he welcomes you. You notice that Joseph and Mary didn't look at both those groups of people and be like, eh, okay, Gentiles, get out of here. We don't want you here. Shoo. And they also didn't look at the shepherds and say, you're dirty and you're getting near my child. No, they welcomed them in. I encourage you to pursue and to seek after diligently this child for your life. Let's pray. God, some people today feel far from you and they think, how could I even have a relationship with this, with this Jesus, this child who was born? And Lord, I, I, I ask that you would stir up in the hearts of those that have many questions today, that this season would be a season of investigation, that they, like the shepherds and the magi, would seek after you and not quit that they would not relent, that they would pursue and pursue and pursue the answers. And Lord, that you would be faithful in answering those questions, that you would be faithful in revealing who you are just as you did to shepherds and wise men. Father, I ask you to to make this a season of transformation in all of us. I ask for those of us that have been walking with, with you a long time, and Lord, maybe this has become lifeless. Maybe we've been distracted by busyness or commercialism 
or, or pain at this time of the year, Lord, or, or whatever it is, it's keeping our eyes off just soaking in the fact that God sent his son to put on human flesh to come near to us so that we could have a relationship with him, that we could be forgiven of our sin and have a new life with him. God, breathe the wonder back into our lives. Forgive us for times that we just turned this into a, a story. And make it new in our hearts this year. And Lord, lead us to worship out of that wonder. To declare how great and awesome you are. And we ask this in the name of Jesus.